All right. We're gonna do it the scan away. I'm gonna suck your brain dry. <laughs> and yes, because space is hard, we bring you Mars Magazine, the podcast. This is Adario Strange here with Vic Song. And this week we have a special guest, the producer of the History Channel documentary, 50 Years of Star Trek, Brian Volk Weiss, joins the Mars podcast. And I'll be talking to him a little bit later. But first, we want to talk about a couple of things that happened this week. Uh, most importantly, today actually was a pretty um, pretty unfortunate event for SpaceX. Elon Musk and his commercial space travel venture. SpaceX had a major explosion at its uh, launch facility. I believe it's in was it Cape Canaveral, right? Yep, down in Florida. Uh, thankfully, there were no people uh, hurt. There was no one involved. But if you will include the links in the show notes on on, on the website, but uh, if you go and look at the at the uh, explosion, it's like I think it's like about I don't know a ten five ten minute video. It's pretty scary. I mean, people who were in the area said that it felt like a little bit like an earthquake. And um, Elon actually weighed in on Twitter. He said, the loss of Falcon vehicle today during the propellant fill operation. Uh, well, this is just him alerting people who didn't already know. Loss of Falcon vehicle during propellant fill operation originated around upper stage oxygen tank. Cause still unknown more soon. And the huh. official statement from SpaceX. Here's the full details. At approximately 9.07 a.m. Eastern Time. During a standard pre-launch static fire test for the AMOS-6 mission, there was an anomaly at SpaceX's Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40, resulting in the loss of the vehicle. The anomaly originated around the upper stage oxygen tank and occurred during propellant loading of the vehicle. Per standing operating procedure, all personnel were clear of the pad and there were no injuries. We are continuing to review the data to identify the root cause. Additional updates will be provided as they become available. And those two statements came out on Thursday, the day of the explosion. But the big note of the whole thing is the fact that um, it had uh, the payload that got destroyed was a satellite for Facebook. And it was a $195 million satellite that Facebook was looking to put in orbit to deliver Internet access to the world. Oh, I thought they was, it was going to bring Internet access to a lot of places in Africa that didn't have Internet connectivity. Well, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, yeah, kind of okay. under under uh, served parts of the world. It's really kind of crazy how ironic all of these things are happening. Um where someone like, you know, with Facebook and its face new, uh, you know, speaking of Facebook, uh, with their whole, we're going to stop relying on humans for the trending algorithm. And then a couple of days later, you know, they start trending fake news in their stories. And then now I think, I think it was a couple of weeks ago where Elon Musk was saying, oh yeah, in September, I'm going to outline our, our plan for SpaceX. And how we're just going to send humans to, to Mars super soon or just like what their whole objective was. And then this happens. So it's kind of some weird cosmic timing that's been happening recently. Mark Zuckerberg released his own statement on the incident and uh, he wrote on Facebook, um, as I'm here in Africa, I'm deeply disappointed to hear that SpaceX's launch failure destroyed our satellite that would have provided connectivity to so many entrepreneurs and everyone else across the continent. Fortunately, we have developed other technologies like Aquila that will connect people as well. We remain committed to our mission of connecting everyone and we will keep working until everyone has the opportunities this satellite would have provided. So what's interesting about that statement is he doesn't say, and we're going to try again. Like, 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 you know, that's that's a one hundred ninety five million dollar disappointment. Right. Right. That explosion. Well, but that's the thing. I mean, this is one of the richest tech companies on the planet. It's worth many billions. And you would think, OK, so you, you know, like you lost one hundred ninety five million. You just take, took that hit. I'm sure there's some insurance that uh, will be in play. Yeah. But I mean, is that, that's just it. He's already like, OK, we'll just deal with other technologies. Really? You just going to give up like that? I mean, I don't know. I thought that was so strange because, you know, he he's talking about entrepreneurs and, you know, he he points them out in his statement. He is not someone who's unfamiliar with risk. And when you think about space and science on a really large scale, well, what's 
the whole thing about the scientific process is that you're going to get a lot of failures. So, you know, I saw some people talking about, like, what does this mean for SpaceX? Does this mean that they can't do it? Well, you would expect them to have a couple of explosions in the whole process of getting a rocket up into space. You would expect that when you're preparing for a manned mission to Mars, that things would go wrong and haywire. The whole point is that you have to keep on going. And I don't know, like, the whole, like, hesitance for Mark Zuckerberg to kind of back Elon Musk up on this and be like, yeah, we're going to do it again, is that, you know, you're kind of teaching entrepreneurs and businesses that space is too big of a financial risk. And maybe it is now for most businesses, but, you know, we talk a lot about space mining companies and what the potential for that is. If you're not willing to buy into that initial risk, then, you know, what's the whole point of us doing SpaceX in the first place? And many of Facebook's critics kind of, uh, they often profile Facebook something as something like a, a walled garden. And so the idea that Facebook would put a satellite into orbit to provide more inter internet access might sound like a great idea. But then when you think of their practices and policies with regard to Facebook, the website and, you know, the mobile experience, suddenly you wonder, well, the access they would provide, would that necessarily be, you know, some great benefit to society? So I'm just kind of wonder, I'm, I was surprised that there weren't more memes. I guess everyone was trying to be sensitive because it was a very dangerous and unfortunate accident. I think right now, because it was so fresh, this just happened this morning, I think people are just kind of parsing the whole, like, implication. They're watching the videos of the explosion and kind of taking in the spectacle of it. I think we'll start getting a lot of the takes on this tomorrow. Based on Elon Musk's statement on Twitter, it seems like he was, you know, he took this in stride, as he should, because, you know, he probably has seen a bunch of accidents that we don't even know about uh, at SpaceX in getting all this up to speed. But the thing I am concerned about is what this means for his Mars aspirations, meaning putting people on Mars. I mean, if you are still at this late stage in the company, having trouble just putting normal satellites. And let's be clear, this wasn't just, um, I don't know, some nondescript mission. I mean, this was the most high profile tech company on the planet next to Apple, which meaning Facebook. We, I mean, you destroyed, uh, well, and, I mean, not on purpose, of course, it was an accident, but you, I mean, you basically, your project destroyed $195 million satellite. Uh, when that kind of stuff is still happening, I mean, it's h a little harder to take you seriously if you're talking about, you know, putting people in the same situation and then also taking them to the red planet. I think that's a lot. A lot of that is his fault, though. Elon Musk has come out time and time again with these really aggressive timelines for when he'd get a manned uh, expedition up to Mars. I think um, he's been saying things, you know, as as amazing and crazy as as, like, you know, 2018, that's when we're going to start doing these things. Whereas when you put that expectation out there and then you get an explosion like this, well, obviously you're going to think that this is not happening. This is, you know, he's behind schedule. Can he actually do it? Whereas if he had been a little more generous or maybe a little more low-key and been like, yeah, next 10 years or so, we would just be like, oh, there's still early stages. This is bound to happen. You know, so I think he kind of brought this upon himself if people... Uh, have the take that SpaceX is a big hoax or it's not anywhere near where he says it's going to be because he's been putting out these very aggressive timelines. In line with these kind of thoughts, there was a major Mars simulation that came to an end, a year-long uh, simulated mission that basically tried to replicate what it might be like for a crew of people basically colonizing Mars for one year. And it was conducted by the University of Hawaii, and the project is called High Seas, the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation Project. And um, they emerged from their dome, none the worse for wear. Some of them had interesting anecdotes. The project hasn't really released their research uh, mm -hmm. notes as to like what was actually, what information was actually gleaned. But I mean, I bring it up because it basically proves that there is still enthusiasm for going to Mars, these kind of accidents notwithstanding. So I don't think that that's, you know, stuff, you know, accidents like this will necessarily take it out of our sights. But when you see someone as ambitious and as, 
I mean, he's moving forward pretty fast and he's, yeah, I mean, he's made a lot of progress in a short amount of time. When you see something like this happen to SpaceX and Elon Musk, it does kind of put a little bit of a dent in our Mars, you know, aspirations. Yeah, again, I think that's that's his fault. I think he's putting a lot of cart before the horse type things because, you know, this, this whole NASA year long uh, uh, simulation thing, it's just further reinforcing the thing that I don't think SpaceX has. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, whether SpaceX had, a, you know, a hand in the, Mar- in the NASA simulation, but are they actually doing these simulations to see if the people that they can get up there are prepared for the, the, the myriad of challenges that are going to be thrown at them? The whole thing is that, you know, these simulations are really important. I mean, you've seen The Martian? The movie with uh, Matt Damon? No, of course not. Of course I've seen it, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like, for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, it's just basically this dude who gets stranded there and all these potential problems that would come up for someone coloni- like one of the first pioneers colonizing or terraforming Mars. You know, they're going to have all these different issues. And, like, if SpaceX is not doing these simulations, then I have to think that they are being maybe a little too optimistic with their timelines. You know, just talking again about, you know, Elon Musk bringing people to Mars. The only thing that kind of makes this whole thing odd to me in terms of, you know, as as you've been saying, kind of putting the cart before the horse, maybe going a little too fast before you conduct more tests – I, I would think that before you try to put people on Mars, wouldn't you try to take people back to the moon? Like, I, I just don't get why you would try to make this epic journey to Mars without first saying, hey, look, look how quickly we put people on the moon. I mean, does that is that just me? I mean, did you consider that? Dario, you're uncovering a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Is this uh You're gonna get Stanley Kubrick's daughter very angry at you very soon. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So I mean, no, I, I again I really think I mean, when you look at the old footage of people bouncing around on the moon, it's exciting. And I think that that would really be exciting again. I mean, and the, you know, the moon is not as far and we did it back in 1969. I mean, you would think that if this was really something Elon Musk was committed to in terms of putting people in, you know, on other planets, how about baby steps? And this is a huge baby step, but the baby step of first trying to put someone on the moon or colonizing the moon. I'm sure there would be so much valuable data that we could get from colonizing. The I know moon what you want to say. Be- you you want to go, you want to talk about milk, don't you? <laughs> talk about moon milk. You know, um, <laughs> I may have had the brief thought about talking about moon milk, but you know, if you're going to preempt. Right. Me. Well, that of course is a reference to independence day resurgence. One of the worst films of 2016. Anyway, so moving on, we want to just give a quick note that uh, Stranger Things has been renewed for a second season. And um, we're very happy about that because we're big fans of the show, the Netflix show. And I'm hearing tell there's I don't know if there's confirmation of this, but I'm hearing tell that Will Byers, the kid who was missing for most of the series and then returned. And spoilers, if you have not seen Stranger Things Uh, At the end of the series, we see a creepy crawly from the upside down world emerge from his cute little mouth in the bathroom and the lights flicker on and off. And so now that I'm hearing that like he may be somehow the villain or the the bad person or the evil person in season two. I personally would hope that they would kind of maybe do it like as, you know, kind of like an anthology or kind of like an Outer Limits thing where, okay, maybe we're still in the same town and maybe we still happen upon Chief Hopper, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. one or two other characters, but generally it's like an entirely different storyline and, you know, different characters. That's what I would hope for. Well, a lot of the chatter is saying that it's a direct continuation from season one, but I'm also seeing stuff that there's going to be new characters. One, I think, is called Max. And it's a girl, but they're calling her Mad Max. So we're, we're keeping with the 80s uh, kind of theme there. And there's allusions to um, another character called the Lost Brother. And who knows what that means. But I, I've seen and tell that there's going to be four new characters. So it's very possible that what we're going to get is some, you know, a direct continuation in, in, in the sense that Will will be a big part of the storyline. But maybe a lot of new faces that'll help uh, freshen things up. So we'll see in 2017. 
And if you want to get more insight into the series, you know, you've seen Stranger Things and you, you know, can't wait for 2017. Uh, we actually did an interview with David Harbour, who plays Chief Hopper in the series. And that's episode 17 of the Mars Magazine podcast. So check that out if you get a chance. And it seems like Netflix is doubling and tripling down on science fiction in recent months because they just released a trailer for a new film, another science fiction film called ARC, and it's spelled A-R-Q. And the trailer is, it's short, um, and it basically shows us kind of like this time loop, um, kind of like Edge of Tomorrow uh, esque, but it's just in one setting, one room, and it tells the story. Well, actually, it's better if I read the kind of synopsis from The Hollywood Reporter, which kind of gave a heads up on the production earlier this year. Uh, they write, Ark is a post-apocalyptic thriller set in the near future when the oil supply has run dry. Trapped in a house and surrounded by a gang of mysterious masked intruders, an engineer must protect a, te a technology that could deliver unlimited energy and end the wars that have consumed the world. The only problem is that the technology has created a time loop that condemns him and his friends all to relive the same day over and over. And I'm assuming that the technology that they're talking about, the device, is the Ark. And in the trailer, we're not giving anything away because the trailer is out there for everyone to see. In the trailer, we see what looks like, uh, I believe, is the Ark. Uh, we see the intruders, the scary intruders that come in. And we also see, at one point, um, a robot. That is yeah. pretty interesting. So this was directed by – well, I think you have more details on this, right? Right. So the guy who directed this and wrote it is Tony Elliott, and he was a story executive story editor on Orphan Black for two seasons. And I love Orphan Black. It's a great speculative sci-fi fiction show about clones. Uh, you guys should check it out if you haven't seen it already. It's really interesting because the way that the Orphan Black series puts low, kind of low key sci fi into our world with like um, just how it might relate to technology that we're almost at, like in terms of cloning and what the repercussions of that are in terms of how our society functions, it seems like the ARC movie is about the same type of thing because it's talking about oil crisis and kind of throwing a sci-fi element in there. So I'm kind of interested to see where this goes, because when I was first watching the trailer, it, it did, like you mentioned, kind of harken back to the edge of tomorrow. And how is that going to really differentiate other than it being, it seems like it's a one set room, mostly movie. But I did have some hope when I saw that uh, little robot at the end. <laughs> it, you know what it reminded me of was that Boston Dynamic robot that we talked about uh on the pod a couple of weeks ago yeah robots are always good robots make everything better <laughs> yeah and and in the trailer we also saw rachel taylor who's uh, i guess i guess she's kind of like part of the netflix uh crew or, or troop now she was um also in jessica jones and she did a great job i think do we know i mean i don't know how deep you're into that marvel marvel thread i'm not deep mm -hmm. into jessica jones but i know they the way her character arc went, I believe she's going to become some superhero yeah. character. Yeah. So she, uh, her character, her name is Trish, and she is Hellcat, which is uh, oh, right. another kind of, you know, in the same way that Jessica Jones, one of the more low-key Marvel heroes, Hellcat is also one of those. And she's part of the Hell's Kitchen crew, along with Daredevil and that whole group. Yeah, I liked her work in uh, in Jessica Jones. She was pretty good. Um, and also co-starring with her in ARC is an actor by the name of Robbie Ar Amell. I don't really know his work. It seems like he's mostly known for The Flash, the hmm. that TV show. I'm I'm not a big DC person, so I haven't really watched that show. So I yeah, love really... The Flash. Don't love that show. I gave it a try. I'm, I'm out on The Flash. But, um, I mean, the trailer looked good. It, it kind of reminded me a little bit about a little bit of Primer. Have you seen Primer? No. I, I know of Primer, though. Yeah, Primer is a very low-budget indie uh, film about time travel. And they kind of play with the same ideas, as you mentioned, as, you know, in Edge of Tomorrow, where there's basically this time loop. And as they keep, as the loop keep move, keeps moving forward, they begin to try to figure out ways that they can change the time loop. I'm not going to sit here and try to explain primer. It, trying to explain primer is basically <laughs> one of the favorite pastimes of 
time travel movie geeks, uh, of which I am not one in terms of being able to explain that stuff. But Primer is a great movie. I don't know if this is a great movie, but I am excited just by the prospect of Netflix continuing to kind of delve into these very mature, sophisticated science fiction themes and ideas, as opposed to just, you know, look, no, no hate on sci-fi channel. I'm a huge fan of sci-fi channel, but you know, <laughs> sometimes some of the stuff they put out there is a little undercooked. Uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica was great, but you know, the, they have a zombie show that's not in, incredible. You know, so it's, so it's hit and miss with, uh, with sci-fi channel. And so what I like about Netflix is that they're really taking science fiction seriously. First with, you know, Stranger Things and now with the arc. So that comes out September 16th and give it a try. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking for it as well. We might even end up watching it multiple times. Stuck in a loop. That was pretty good. That's pretty good. So moving on, speaking of uh, watching multiple times, um, we now will give you our conversation with Brian Volkweiss, the producer of 50 Years of Star Trek, uh, the series, the franchise that seems like it will never end. We It started uh, in the 60s. Uh, it's had multiple iterations in terms of television you know, shows and movies, and now CBS is creating another television version of the show. So this is just like the legacy of Star Trek lives on. And Brian Volk Weiss will take us deeper into the legacy, history, and lore of Star Trek. And here we are on the Mars Magazine podcast, and we have an incredible guest this week, Brian Volk Weiss, the producer of the recently aired 50 Years of Star Trek, the documentary that aired on the History Channel. Brian, how are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me on your show. And I love I love anything with the name Mars in it. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you for doing uh, such great work. I mean, first You're of all... very kind. So the thing that kind of struck me uh, about the documentary was the detail and the sheer... I guess, broad span of, of people that you managed to get. Like, how long did you work on this film? Uh, close to a little bit, actually a little bit over three years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it shows. So, I mean, what, um, well, th let's just jump right to one of kind of like the big gets of the film, Leonard Nimoy. Apparently this is, um, what I'm hearing is that this is one of the last interviews Leonard Nimoy uh, gave. And we, We've been told uh, by people on his side of the fence that this was his last full interview, literally his last that he ever did. I, in an abundance of caution, have added the word uh, w words one of, because you never know, and I don't want it to ever come out that we're wrong. Right. But from what I've been told by people, uh, like I said, uh, connected to Mr. Nimoy directly, this was his last full uh, interview. Yeah, I, you know, I think that caution is uh, – that's a, that, that was a good idea because in the geek sci-fi universe, there's oh always – Yeah, there's always someone who wants to kind of one-up you and say, aha, you know. Like, yeah. Well, can I, can I tell – are you a big Trekkie, I assume? Oh, I'm a huge Trekkie. That, that's kind of – part of this show is we're always uh, kind of debating uh, Star Wars versus the Trek, and uh, I'm, I'm the Trek guy. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I gotta tell you, man, I'm, uh, I'm right on the line. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm like 50-50. There's parts to both. But can I tell you my favorite example of, uh, Trekkies, uh, which have one I consider myself, uh, nitpicking? Oh, please. My, my favorite, whatever. Yes. Do you remember the episode Family? It was the, uh, the episode right after The Best of Both Worlds, two-parter, Next Generation. I'm um, not my my episode name knowledge is not great, but if you give me kind of like what it's, happened, uh, probably... it's the one where Picard goes home and meets his brother, and they oh, have a yeah. big fight in the mud. Yeah, the last uh, the last shot of the episode is Picard's nephew uh, sitting under a tree, looking up at the stars, and uh, which has, of course, tremendous emotional impact to uh, what was going on in the episode. And I remember reading criticism of that shot because people had figured out what the stars would look like from France 
200 years in the future and they had gotten the uh, the the star the stars wrong this is real that's this really right. happened oh yeah that absolutely happened oh absolutely God. it wasn't one person it was like several people wow. who i'm sure were astronomers or worked at you know jpl or something but right. uh, after that i uh, i learned uh, uh and that was a long time ago but after that i learned to take uh, everything with a grain of salt but yes yeah, so we i believe we have one of the uh, the last interviews that Mr. Nimoy ever did. Yeah, well, it's interesting. We're actually speaking on a somewhat historic day. Um, we this today is Thursday, and SpaceX just uh, the news reported had like, a major explosion on. I their, heard about yeah. I heard about the explosion, but it was too soon to tell if anybody had been hurt. Have you heard if anyone's been hurt? I haven't heard anything. I've just heard reports that uh, people in nearby buildings felt the shake, like it almost felt like maybe an earthquake or something. And I, I do know that there was a supposedly a Facebook satellite uh, aboard, like as part of the payload. Um, to oh, help. I thought it was an engine test. Well, I mean, that's, my understanding is that there was actually, yes, that it was an engine test, but there was actually a payload on the platform. Oh. This is what I mean. Yeah, so. Oh, yes, oh wait, I'm, I, just, I just Googled it. I just Googled it. Yeah, it was on the pad. It wasn't an engine test. Oh, oh yeah. man, that sucks. But you know what? If nobody got hurt, and what I'm looking at now, it seems to it seems to look like nobody got hurt. If nobody got hurt, get to them. Right. Get to them. You can't do what they're doing without having shit go wrong. Right. So yeah. get to them. Yeah, and so the reason I bring that up is because I think part of my personal love, and I, I would like for you to speak to this, part of my personal love for Star Trek is just – it it really just speaks, aside from kind of like the somewhat utopian future of, you know, economy and all that stuff, it speaks to kind of just us blazing a trail out into the stars and kind of, you know, just the, the adventurer spirit. So I'm just wondering, like, from your vantage point, I mean, what was, you know, as a child growing up, you know, what how'd you come into the Trek? You know, what what just give me like, you know, what what inspired you about the uh, about the, the franchise, the series? You know, my mom introduced me to it. My mom was a big fan. Uh, my mom uh, is a scientist, Ph.D., uh, and all that. One of the first women uh, Ph.D.s to come out of her college and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, she loved science, and she got me into it. Um, the thing that, like, really uh, grabbed me was uh, I was very young when Star Trek II came out. Um, I believe, if my math is right, I was six or seven years old. And uh, I immediately latched on to um, what, for me at least, was the central theme of the movie, which was when Kirk says, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. That um, essentially became the... uh, um, the, the guiding philosophy of my entire life. Um, and because it came from Star Trek, um, it, it was directly connected to Star Trek. So, um, and I, I'm a big, my, if, if reincarnation is a real thing, which I don't know if it is or it isn't, but if it is, I, I think in the past, uh, in a past life, I was some sort of uh, naval, something to do with the Navy. I just love boats. I wish I had joined the Navy. Um, and that aspect of Star Trek, which obviously uh, Nicholas Meyer gravitated towards and most of the movies started heading towards, and then Next Generation also embraced, certainly Deep Space Nine, um, that really uh, appealed to me. So that's what got me into it and, and, and kept me into it. And then the shows that didn't have that aspect of it too much, I didn't like uh, as much. So I'm not a huge Voyager fan, for example. And I uh, I like Enterprise more than most. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Enterprise, Um, I feel like Enterprise get, gets dinged a little too much. I actually loved Enterprise. I thought it did some interesting things that we hadn't really seen before. I thought it had a great first season. I thought it had a really good fourth season. I think uh, seasons two and three uh, definitely uh, missed the mark a bit. Um, but, uh, two out of four ain't bad. And, uh, yeah, even the crappy second and third season still had some good moments. And it was cast well. I thought it was cast really well. For the most part. <laughs> a couple, and, and, couple and, misfires. And just so we make sure that we have, like, all the credits right. So you're the executive producer. Um, the, it was this, the documentary was directed by, um, Ian Romaine. Am I saying that correctly? Correct. 
That is correct. And one of the writers, I think, also a producer, Joe Braswell? Correct. Okay. What really struck me was this. I mean, I feel like I tell people I'm a Trekkie, and yes, I didn't know the name of that episode that you just (laughs) mentioned. But I, a lot of the uh, previous writers and producers on the Star Trek series and films, their names, I didn't know, I, their faces were unfamiliar to me, but I, their names jumped out at me. And I don't remember growing up thinking, oh, I want to write a Star Trek episode or something. I just remember thinking, you know, oh, man, the show's over now and I'm just going to stare at the screen and look at these names. And you got those names. You brought those names yeah. to life. And you you brought them into the documentary. We have people like, uh, let's see, Bronin Braga. That's one of the people I definitely, like, I, I, that name always stuck out. Ronald D. Moore. Uh, he was like a producer on Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. He was also responsible for those out there listening um, for, well, he's one of the people was responsible for the uh, re- uh, the reboot of Battlestar Galactica, which was incredibly successful and yep. really, very well received. Um, oh, yeah. Michael Sussman. So, I mean, the reason I appreciated that is just because, you know, we often talk to, I guess, actors and to a lesser extent directors about a lot of these science fiction, some of the impactful science fiction properties. But you actually talk to the writers, like, you know, DC Fontana, JDF Black. I mean, you went deep into you know, the, the first series history. I mean, can you, can you talk about, like, how hard that was? I mean, did you, how, you know, some of these people, I'm sure, were difficult to find. Yeah, I mean, it, listen, nothing's hard if, uh, you know, you make as many phone calls as is necessary. So uh, we, you know, we knew the people to call, and we just kept calling until they agreed to do it. And most of them, it didn't take more than one phone call. You know, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, a lot of people that worked on the original series have passed away, so, uh, you know, the ones that are left, I think are eager to, uh, you know, get their views and their positions uh, memorialized one last time. Um, some of them one last time, some of them for the first time. The thing which is very interesting, and, you know, I've basically, in addition to being a fan of the show, I've also, I believe I've seen all or almost all of uh, the documentaries that have ever been made uh, about the show or about the franchise. And I've also read probably 95% of the books written about the franchise. So one of the things that I noticed, uh, and this is not just our documentary, this is a documentaries that have come out in the last year or two or books that have come out in the last year or two, is a lot of e uh not just the writers, but also the talent, Basically, so much time has gone by, and a few people have passed away, that basically uh, we're starting to get more and more of the real story uh, as to a lot of the things that were going on. So that that's something, like there were a bunch of people we asked questions to that I knew the answer to because I had seen them answer the same question 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But because I had noticed this phenomenon, especially in books, I was very curious to see in 2016 what would they say versus what they said in 1996. And I would say 80% of the time, either the first time we asked the question, because what we'd do is we'd ask the question, and 80% of the time we'd get more scoop, more detail of a granular nature than they had given before. But even in the 20% of the time where they just gave us the answer that I had heard before, what we would do is we would say, hey, listen, if that's your answer, cool, get it, no problem. But I just want to give you a chance. Do you want to say something else? Do you want to say what really was happening if something else was going? And I'd say if we did that 10 times, seven times they would laugh and be like, all right, all right, all right, here's what happened. And then we'd get, we'd get, you know, we'd get a little bit more, uh, we'd get a little bit more scoop. Right. And so before we go too much further uh, into the the Trek universe, I just want to give people a sense of who you are. Now, um, during the documentary, you had like a a small panel of, of, you know, some people who were, you know, from the science community, from the Hollywood community. But then I noticed you had someone who's actually, uh, an important person to me with regard to the Trek uh, in, a, in an offhand way, Kevin Pollack, who does possibly the best William Shatner as Captain Kirk Absolutely. impression Absolutely. in the history of, of comedy. Um, people, listeners, if you haven't heard Kevin Pollack do uh, William Shatner, uh, Captain Kirk, 
Go find it. Look it up. You, I mean, I remember one day, and this is maybe about, ooh, I'm going to say six months ago. I might have spent like two hours just watching this guy just do the <laughs> Kirk. I, I, I can't get enough of it. So, but anyway, I, I bring that up to say he's he's a very well known comedian, and that makes me wonder. So, I, from my understanding, you have a background in you know producing comedy, and you, you know you're you're pretty you know uh, influential in the comedy world. How did you come from that into this? I'm basically at a point in my career where it, this is the greatest thing in the world. It just happened, you know, within the last twelve months, where I'm able to start doing more and more with, for lack of a better expression, my hobbies uh, than I ever have before. So 99.9% .9 of my career has been comedy related, but 99% uh, of my life has been, you know, connected to Star Wars and Star Trek and a lot of that other stuff. So, um, you know, basically between Ian Romaine uh, and myself, uh, you know, who, Ian is also a gigantic Star Trek fan. We were like, listen, we got access to these people. We got access to cameras and, and, and lights and, and editing bays. Uh, why don't we, why don't we do this? And, and, and that's, that's what it was. So we just, we just started interviewing people. We literally started interviewing people, like I said, close to three years ago. And, uh, we didn't even start editing until probably about a year ago. So for two years, we just started bagging interviews. And, uh, then about a year ago, we were like, all right, we got enough. And, uh, you know, I remember we were at Mike Westmore's house. He did all the makeup for, I think, pretty much everything other than the original series. And, uh, you know, we're at his house, and we're shooting the interview and everything. It was phenomenal, you know, to be completely honest with you, and I mean no disrespect to Mr. Westmore. We probably should have interviewed him for an hour. I think we interviewed him for uh, probably three hours, maybe four. Uh, it, was just, it was just unbelievable, the stuff he was telling us. And I remember Ian and I walked out of his house, and we looked at each other, and uh, literally almost at the same time we said, should we start editing? And that's that's that's... That's basically uh, how that went down. But my favorite, my favorite interview, my favorite thing in the whole movie, and we didn't put most of it in the movie, by the way. So <laughs> I, I really wanted to, believe me. Uh, we were shooting another show, a comedy in Florida, and I had heard somehow that uh, uh, the, the Scotty's nephew, Ike uh, Isaacman, or Isaacman, I, guess, I, I can never pronounce it. I'm very bad with names. Um, had moved to the 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 Walt Disney uh, community. You know, Walt Disney himself designed like a a community to, for people to live in, and it, it 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 it's still operating, but it's sort of considered to be a weird failure. Um, but I remember reading an article a hundred years ago that uh, he had moved there, and that's where he was living, and we were shooting near that community. So we literally, through Twitter and Facebook, hunted him down, found him, and uh, got him to agree to do an interview. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, truly one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Everything went wrong. The plan was to, uh, you know, we were shooting a pilot, and the plan was we'd wrap the pilot, then we would drive 20 miles. We rented a hotel, a really nice hotel room, where we could film the interview. And the last day of shooting... Uh, the last minute of shooting, not the last day, the last minute of the last day, uh, our gear was in a cart and the brake was on. And for whatever reason, the brake, like a ghost, the, the brake just <laughs> disengaged. And we all saw it was out of a movie. The cart just gently rolled down a dock and fell into a lake. And all of our gear was destroyed. Oh, and uh, we, you know, that's what insurance is for. Yeah. But literally the next day, uh, you know, Ike and his wife showed up, and uh, he very, uh, he he really played ball because we we filmed his entire interview uh, on my uh, iPhone. So uh, and he, uh, our tri, everything fell into the lake. So like our tripods, everything, and luckily we had filmed. Uh, uh, luckily, we had rented this room that came with a kitchen, and I was able to salvage uh, from our gear uh, a roll of uh, gaff tape. So uh, basically, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we 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 gaff taped a, a fork from the kitchen to the back of a chair and used that as the tripod. We wedged my phone into the fork, and Ike. 
who would have been well within his right to say, fuck this and storm out of there, right. uh, played ball and uh, gave us a great interview. So as a fan of Star Trek II, I-, I haven't seen him be interviewed too many times. Have you? No, no. I mean, there are actually a number of people uh, yeah. in, in this film that just – I've never heard from before. I'm, I mean, I'm sure some of them do, have done, you know, extensive interviews. But I mean, this. I mean, I'll just go to another thing. Um, the Desi Lu connection. Um, I didn't know about that. The whole Lucille Ball anecdote that uh, is told in the film. I don't want to maybe spoil too much for those out there. So this is. Um, it began, I think, last weekend airing, and it airs until the 19th of September. Um, no, it aired once. Uh, about two weeks ago, and it is airing one more time uh, on the 9th of September. Um, And then basically what they're going to do is just, uh, anytime there's like a Star Trek event, they're going to pull it out and uh, rerun it. Uh, They don't want to burn it, you know, they want to be very precious with it, which I'm so grateful for. So they're just going to air it uh, around, you know, at the 55th anniversary or when uh, the next uh, Star Trek movie comes out or the premiere of uh, Discovery or whatever. Right, and so those listening out there, you have one more chance to see it before uh, the History Channel gets precious and puts it back into the vault. Um, That's right. One thing that I really love that you guys did with the film is I think, you know, sometimes you watch documentaries about whatever franchises or epic film, you know, history, and what you guys did was you actually went into the technology of Star Trek, which I think the science and technology of Star Trek, which I think is possibly, I mean, look, on your panel, you had someone from NASA. I mean, it, it's probably one of the main uh, inspirations for a lot of scientists and, and technologists that goes maybe under uh, appreciated or under mentioned. Well, I'll tell you something funny. When we interviewed Mr. Nimoy, I'll never forget, he uh, he was standing there on checking his iPhone, and then he looks up, and he just goes, uh, I remember when these were props. <laughs> that's awesome. That's and awesome. I, bet, I bet he said that to a lot of people. My guess is that's not the first time he ever said that. Right, but right. it's one of the greatest things I've ever heard in my life uh, because of who he is and what he's done. But it makes the point as it relates to your question. Um, you know, one of the things, um, there's a great book that just came out about, uh, about Star Trek, and I think it's actually in our documentary as well. But supermarkets didn't even have automatic opening and closing doors when Star Trek premiered. So, like, it's easy to be like, oh, Star Trek figured out cell phones ahead of time. Star Trek figured out, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, medical device tricorders sort of ahead of time. Those They're not here yet, but they're very close. Um, but it, it, it was still so much that was new. Even the doors had never been seen before. One of the things I didn't know until we found this out ourselves, the miniskirt had not even arrived in the United States yet. The miniskirt was blowing up in England, and uh, Roddenberry, for some reason, was aware of that. And uh, the first time Americans saw miniskirts on television was on Star Trek. So... It, it's not just the cell phones, it, the flip phones, and, and, and you know, all that stuff. Uh, as I'm sure you know, you know, it seems like we're very close to having phasers and lasers on oh, yeah. naval ships in the next year or two. So, you know, it, it really is amazing. And, and one of the cool things that Gene did with the old series, by the way, I love how I call Leonard Nimoy Mr. Nimoy <laughs> and Gene Roddenberry Gene. Right. I'm not exactly sure. Well, I'm so comfortable with uh, Mr. Roddenberry, but uh, well, that I tells you a lot yeah. about the two different uh, individuals. He really does. He really does. Yeah. It's really yeah. funny. But anyway, um, but no, Roddenberry knew a lot of people at JPL and worked very hard to integrate their view for the next fifty to two hundred years uh, before the show even premiered. Um, so I think it's a testament to that research he did. Uh, there was somebody from JPL on set every day. I've heard. So, um, you know, I think it's a testament to that that makes the science so applicable to everything going on, even though the thing was shot 50 years ago. I noticed you spent very little time on the J.J. Abrams version of Star Trek. And I just want to say before I, you can I don't know what your answer is going to be. But before you say I, for me as a 
uh, alternate universe version of Star Trek, I actually wasn't uh, like I, I was fine with you not really going deep into the new Star Trek movies. Um, I'm curious, was that like a specific decision? Was it just logistics? I, listen, every movie is a, a work of individual human creation, right? Mm -hmm. So you go with your gut and you go with what you know and you go with what you like. Mm -hmm. I think that the the first movie that J.J. made is the second best Star Trek ever made, right behind Rathacon. Wow. It is, I think it is utter genius. There's flaws with it, there's problems with it, but it, it, the, the fact that I love it and my wife, who doesn't know a goddamn thing about Star Trek, the fact that she loved it as well, like, that's a great movie, right. in my opinion. The second one is garbage. I think it's worse than Star Trek V. Uh, it might Ouch. be worse than Nemesis. I think it is utter garbage. My guess is that J.J. had already booked Star Wars and was starting not to give a shit about Star Trek because right. he's so talented and he's so detail-oriented and he's so smart. And that movie is so fucking stupid. Um, I just think he started not paying attention to it. And I just saw a new one, you know, a couple weeks ago. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but they killed the bad guys with the Beastie Boys. So uh, yeah. that, uh, that uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think the latest one is, a, I do think the latest one is slightly better than Star Trek V, but, but not by much. I also don't know if you've noticed this or not, but um, J.J. has been connected to three movies. Two of the three, the antagonist uh, essentially had a, a gripe that doesn't make any sense. But more interesting, the first one and the third one both used abandoned alien technology as their weapons, which uh, that's a hell of a coincidence for uh, Christopher Pine's uh, Captain Kirk to constantly right. be dealing with uh, enemies with no gripe uh, with uh, abandoned alien mining technology. Right. Yeah, And see, the, you're speaking to – I'm, I'm so happy you're saying this because – these are the exact points I've made when we talked about these new films uh, recently on the podcast. I mean, just that's it just they don't seem in the spirit of Star Trek as we know it. Star Trek respects science. It respects uh, the ideas uh, behind science and technology. And, the, and Star Trek generally goes to great lengths to explain what's happening and to make everything come together. And as much as I love J.J. Abrams, a lot of what he does is kind of, you know, sometimes based on, I guess, magic, you know, kind of. Like you said, coincidence. It's fine. My new go-to joke with my friends who are nerds like me. I'm always whatever. I'm always like, "Don't get me upset, or I'll kill you with Beastie Boys music." <laughs> and it was just, I literally sat there in the movie, and I like, I, I was completely out of the movie. I'm like, the amount of people involved with making a movie that have to write a script, approve a script, shoot it. Like the fact that no one along the line said. Hey, I just want to make sure you know at the end of the movie we're killing the bad guys with Beastie Boys. <laughs> and no one was like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do that. And at this point, I'm nitpicking, but the other thing that cracked me up was all of, like, after the second one came out, everyone was like, this one is going to be out in space during the five-year mission, the five-year mission. There's no Earth, there's no Earth. And then I see the movie, and I'm like, I don't know if having a gigantic space station that looks a lot like Earth in close-ups and medium shots uh, – I don't care how far away it is from Earth, but that's really not uh, conveying the, uh, the the point you're trying to make, which right. is they're out in space and nobody can help them. Right. I, I think they said there was a million people on that thing. Yeah, something like billion? that. Yeah, it was like yeah. the size Either of a, a small... a million or a billion. Yeah, it's the size yeah. of a city. And I'm like, oh, that's not really a ship, uh, a tiny little ship alone, and if it breaks down, can't get out. I... I, I I, 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 yeah, I mean, I literally was uh, just sitting there baffled. I also I thought it looked cheap. I thought there was a lot of stuff that looked cheap. Yeah, I, okay. I, uh, Thank you. Thank the, you. Uh, yeah, they, like they had like tubing they bought at Home Depot, spray painted <laughs> to look like you know broken pipes. I'm like, what's going on here? I I, uh, I 
I don't know why it got the reviews it did. I, uh, it's not as bad as the second one where, you know, triple blood saved people. Uh, but uh, it, it was still really, really, really bad. And it didn't do well. Right. It didn't do well. It opened bad. It's, it's performing bad. It, yeah, it absolutely. Uh, awful, 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 awful movie. Sir, at least in my book, your, your Star Trek cred has gone through the roof now. I uh, just want to <laughs> make that note. So one last thing. So we know that CBS is working on a new Star Trek series. And I'm just wondering, you know, as a, as a as an insider, an entertainment insider, have you heard tell of like what's going on? I mean, I know I don't think you're involved with it, but I'm just wondering if you've heard any chatter. I'm not involved with it at all. And I'll be honest with you. I knew a lot of scoop. Uh, if, if you and I were talking like two months ago, I knew a lot of scoop. But a lot of that scoop was uh, revealed uh, a week or two ago. So, like, I've known for two months that uh, it was going to be a female lead. I knew for a couple months that it wasn't going to be uh, – we're not focusing on the captain. So I had a lot of scoop. But as of, like, a week or two ago, all my scoop uh, has been declassified. So I have no more – I have no more scoop. Um, but uh, I'm very curious. I uh, My hope – for what they would have done, um, and of course, you know, who, who, who gives a shit what I think, but my hope as one man with one hope and one, one, being one fan is uh, I really wish they had started the series where, you know, we fade in and there's a bunch of people we've never seen before waiting in an airlock and the door opens and uh, Picard and the entire crew of the E has just come back from their last five-year mission they uh, shake hands, Picard turns over the Enterprise, and a new crew goes in, and uh, boom, takes the Enterprise out for uh, a new mission. And, you know, somewhere in the end of Season 2, the Enterprise E gets destroyed, and then Enterprise Season 3, we meet the Enterprise F. But that was my hope. Hmm. Um, but uh, obviously I was not uh, consulted. The reason I have great hope that this will be a phenomenal show, two words, Nicholas Meyer. So I mean that's uh, the guy. I don't think he's missed. I don't think he's missed the target once ever. Can you just for the for the listeners break down who that is? Uh, Nicholas Meyer uh, directed Star Trek II, but he is the uncredited writer of Star Trek II as well. Um, he had minimal involvement with Star Trek Three, but he basically wrote at least half of Star Trek IV. I believe he wrote ever Star Trek IV was divided. Uh, one guy wrote the beginning and end of Star Trek IV that did not take place in San Francisco in 1986, and Nicholas Myers. Uh, wrote everything that took place in the past, so he basically wrote half of Star Trek IV. And then, when Star Trek V threatened to destroy the entire series, uh, he uh, came in and, uh, with a limited budget and lots of things working against him, uh, made another wonderful movie in Star Trek VI uh, that he also uh, was incredibly involved with writing. So he basically wrote and directed that as well. And he was brought in basically as a uh, sort of a, you know, a mid-level kind of writer on uh, the new Star Trek. And it seems like he has worked his way up uh, to the point where he is borderline co-running the show. Hmm. And we interviewed him. We had a great interview with him uh, for our doc. And one of the funniest things I've ever seen was I was watching him talk. And all of a sudden, mid-sentence, he starts yelling, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And our camera guy had literally fallen asleep, and his head was being held up by the camera. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. But anyway, um, yeah, so we, uh, in our doc, because uh, it was only two hours, uh, you know, he's only in the doc, you know, probably for about two or three minutes. Um, but we interviewed him for close to two hours. And um, he, uh, he was, he was, oh my God, he was great. I mean, he was just so... He was just so uh, just so generous with his time, so informative, and uh, I, I, in my mind, not even just Star Trek. I've seen everything the man's done, um, but especially with Star Trek, the guy literally cannot do any wrong. And and just um, to let listeners know, just who is in the documentary, really quickly. Um, of course, uh, Whoopi Goldberg from the Next uh, Generation, Guinan, Jonathan Frakes, uh, Riker, Jerry Ryan, Seven of Nine from um, Voyager, 
Uh, let's see, uh, Walter Koenig from um, the original series, Nichelle Nichols from the original series, Michael Dorn, Worf, you guys probably all know, um, yeah. from Next Generation and from Deep Space Nine. Uh, and then some other people like um, Sarah Silverman, who's like a very well-known comedian now, but uh, I think she had like kind of like an early bit part on uh, Voyager. Um, one Tim of her Ryan. first roles. Yeah, one of her first roles. Yeah, and Tim Russ, who played uh, Tuvok on Voyager. So, I mean, it, it's there are just – it's packed with amazing – my, we got Bruce Campbell from Army of Darkness. We got Olivia Munn, who's just like a big geek. You know, we got Doug Drexler, who did all the special effects uh, for, you know, just about everything. We got uh, Christopher Lloyd, uh, who was a Klingon in Star Trek III. Um, we got Leonard Nimoy. We got Simon Pegg. We got Ethan Phillips, Kevin Pollack. We got Rod Roddenberry. Um, yeah, Carl Urban. We got him, yep. We got Armin Sherman, who played Quark. Uh, yeah. We, uh, and then you have, you have one of my favorite characters, uh, Q, uh, yeah. known in real life as John DeLancey. Yes, yes. He was tough. He's one of the toughest people we had getting, actually. That's interesting because, I, you know, that doesn't surprise me. I've heard very little from him, and so when he came up, yeah. I was actually very surprised. We had to get a lot of people to text him. So what we did when we had trouble getting people is uh, we would have people text. So we would be like, hey, do you know so-and-so? Would you shoot them a text that you just did the interview and you had a good experience? And we literally just had everybody texting him, and then he finally agreed to do it. But he, uh, he, there was a bunch of people we tried to get that we didn't get. Um, but of all the people we tried to get that we almost didn't get, uh, he, uh, he was really, really, he was the toughest. Yeah, and the, the franchise is very protective of of the property and its people. And I noticed, like, um, when I'm watching, when I, you know, when the film starts, uh, there's kind of like a disclaimer saying that it's not, you know, yeah. um, associated with Paramount and not authorized yeah. by, you know. And I have to say, when I saw that, I said, "Uh oh, you know, uh, is this, you know, what what does that mean?" And then it meant nothing because you guys got <laughs> like these amazing <laughs> interviews with like just the top uh, people. So, it, but it, I mean, you know, you got listen. Start to, Paramount owns Star Trek. You've got to be respectful of that. You know, and recently, I'm sure you know all the stuff going on with the fan films. Um, you know, some people, I'm not saying they crossed the line or they didn't, but Paramount perceived them as crossing the line. And, you know, you've got to be very, very respectful. And I don't view, I do not view Paramount as this evil corporation that does not understand Star Trek. I think that is ridiculous. Um... I think that people who say that do not appreciate the risk that any company has to put to make a movie. Uh, Star Trek One cost them forty-five million dollars when eighteen months earlier Star Wars had cost nine million. So you can't sit there and say Paramount doesn't understand uh, what they have. They they absolutely have understand it, and time and time again. Uh, when one of the movies is bombed, they made another one. The, the, the very, if they didn't understand what they had, they wouldn't have made Star Trek VI. I mean, it's, it's Star Trek V was a disaster. So, uh, yeah. So I, I always, uh, I, I, since I was, even before I was in show business, I, I was always very uh, vocal. And whenever I hear people be like, Paramount's screwing it up. I go, yeah, out of your fucking mind. Let's see you risk $45 million. Uh, and by the way, the budgets always went up. Always. Star Trek Two did well. They spent more on Star Trek Three. Star Trek Three did okay. They spent more on Star Trek Four. That's not how you treat something you don't respect. Right. And so, just to wrap up, I'm kind of you know again on this show. I am the resident Trekkie. I promote it. I talk about it. I, I tell people why I love it. You, I mean, you've done you know the the biggest uh, nod to Star Trek. You've created a touchstone, a historic marker, something that we can all refer back to. So, I'm just, if you could tell listeners out there why, if they you know let's say they're inundated with uh, Star Wars fair. And, you know, they, they hear all these other, you know, properties out there. Why is Star Trek so important uh, if you're, you know, someone who not just loves science fiction, but is maybe, you know, an early budding scientist or, you know, programmer? Like, why, why is it important to you 
for our future? For me, it's important because it sort of gave me a code, uh, going back to, you know, what I was saying with, uh, you know, Captain Kirk's whole philosophy of I don't believe in the no-win scenario. So just like anybody else, I've had a billion moments in my life where things were not going my way and I failed and it was a disaster and it was a mess. And then I would just have to remind myself, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. And I got back up and I kept fighting and things turned out okay. So for me, it's a, it's like a, it's like a simple code. And like I said, I love the Navy stuff and I love, you know, I love going out there and exploring strange new worlds as best I can, having never left the earth. Um, as it relates to other people, who may or may not be fans already, uh, especially to the people who may not be, you know, the first thing I would stress, which I feel often gets lost, especially by hardcore Trekkies who forget about this, but it's the thing that brought them in originally. It's fun. It's fun. They're good characters. When it's cast well, it's good characters. The, the, the original cast, they were great characters, and they were cast great. And it was just fun to watch, especially in the old series, the, these three dudes who just had a blast you know, great rapport with each other. So it was just fun. It was a lot of comedy, and it was just fun, and it was exciting. The monsters were scary and all that stuff, so it was fun. The second thing is, it's smart, you know, and I'm not one of these people that thinks most television is stupid and dumb and most movies are dumb. I, I'm not one of these people. I, I think that uh, it's very hard to, to make uh, uh, TVs and TV shows and movies, and especially lately, I think the TV and movies have gotten a lot smarter. So I'm not sitting here saying Star Trek is the only smart thing or the smartest thing, but it is smart, and it is trying to go at things in a different way in that it – it try, like the whole premise of the first direct of the prime directive, like yeah, yeah, not too many shows would have spent the time coming up with a rule to follow and then kind of screw up their characters and what they're doing, which ended up making the stories better. So that's a great example of the intelligence brought to the writing that helped make the show what it is. Um, number one and number two, and then number three, and I, this has been said a trillion times, so I'm almost loath to say it, but. It's optimistic. And by the way, in my life, at least, in my lifetime, mm-hmm. we have definitely probably had the darkest two or three years of my life uh, this year and last year. And, of course, it all started with 9-11. So uh, it basically, Star Trek came out during America's golden years. You know, it was after World War II. The whole world was covered in debris, and we didn't have any damage. And, uh, you know, we... There was one company that made airplanes, Boeing, uh, not five. So uh, from when Star Trek started up until 9-11, it was an American-dominated world, and it was a great time to be uh, American. Post-9-11, and certainly these last two or three years, certainly with the rise of ISIS, um, it's become a very dark place, uh, at least dark compared to my childhood. So I think more than ever... Star Trek's optimism um, that, you know, not only will black people and white people be getting along, uh, but, uh, or, you know, we'll be getting along with Klingons and, and everybody else, too. I think that that's a uh, I think that that's a very powerful message to have in 2016 and 17 and, and beyond. I'm a little curious how they uh, eliminated money. I'm always very, that's <laughs> one thing with Star Trek, I'm like, how, how are we going to do that? Right. Uh, Picard gives this little speech to uh, Alfre Woodard at Star Trek First Contact, where he's like, yeah, we don't have money, we just, uh, you know, we just, uh, we contribute to society, that's how we get paid. I'm always like, well, that sounds great. I'm curious how we go about doing that. But, oh, um, I- I'll, I'll actually mention we uh, on a previous episode um, for listeners and and for yourself we uh, interviewed the author of a book called Treconomics. Um, yeah. So that it gives a couple of clues as to how it might have happened. I think I have not read that. So you're at, you break you bring up a great point. I should read that before I uh, scratch, I scratch my head about it. Certainly during an interview, but uh, but anyway, yeah, I think the optimism is more important than ever. Yeah, and so. Once again, the film is 50 Years of Star Trek. It will air again on the History Channel on September 9th. Brian Volkweiss, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so I want to thank Brian Volkweiss again, the producer of 50 Years of Star Trek, the documentary, for joining us on the Mars Magazine podcast. And you can check out the – it already aired once, uh, like about a week or so ago. But um, if you – 
want to check it out, it will be airing on the History Channel again on September 9th at 10 p.m. and September 10th at 2 a.m. And that's, again, on the History Channel. And that will bring us to the end of this episode of the Mars Magazine podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. And if you want to check us out on the Internet, you can visit us at Twitter.com slash Mars Magazine or go to MarsMagazine.com. And special programming note for the following episode after this, uh, our good friend Vic Song will be out. But we will have a special episode on deck with a special guest talking about artificial intelligence and the singularity. This has been Adario Strange for the Mars Magazine podcast, and we will see you in the future.